So welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome back to another edition, another episode of Mastering the Life with yours truly. I am Stephen Jones, National Director of Miss Supranational Trinidad and Tobago. And with me today, and with us today, to have a little sit down chat and for me to get a chance to kind of dig open a little bit into her life is the beautiful, the intelligent, the outstanding young woman in this year's competition representing the area of Chagonas. She is none other than Samantha Rampasad. Sam, welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to have this conversation with you all today. It's good to have you. How have you been? You, I know you've been inside in the house for at least three months. Your complexion has changed. What's going on with, in Sam's world? That's one of the additional benefits. Actually. <laughs> I can make the best out of my time home quarantine, as we call it. Of course. I've been improving my mental health and, you know, my physical appearance. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of dieting in terms of all these street diets. I'm trying to take care of my acne that's been with me for yeah. longer than 10 years. It's been a struggle. So, you know, I've been really making the best of this time and connecting with my family, you know, because family is really important to me. Of course, of course. And catching up on Netflix. On uh, binge watching Netflix. Binge watching Netflix. I don't yeah. think I've watched television so much in my life, and I'm not a TV person. <laughs> So it feels good. But you mentioned something quite beautiful. And I think it's important for your, your friends, your fans, the people who are joining us on this live to kind of get a little bit of sense of what's that family dynamic like? Well, I live with my mom and my dad here at home. But to me, family is the foundation of everything I do. Sometimes, you know, when I feel I don't have their support, it makes you feel a little bit shaky. But I guess, you know, as time goes along, everything falls into place. Uh, my parents and I are really close. We're together in everything I do. And then I have my sister and my nephew and my brother-in-law. So we always meet up, whether it's on weekends or whatnot. But it's been difficult during this quarantine time, yeah. not being able to spend that much time with everyone, you know, having to spend your birthday at home alone. The highlight of my birthday was going to the grocery for groceries. Can you believe that? That was <laughs> my birthday this year. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> my sister took me to the grocery because we had to get a few stuff. Wow. And we made a video, like, the highlights of my birthday is actually going to the grocery. I never thought this day would come, but Look yeah. At that. Look <laughs> at that. Well, I don't envy you, and I'm not looking forward <laughs> to my birthday, which is in July. So I can't say I identify, but I feel your pain. Because if you're anything like me, we're all about celebrating life. And we use, my family, we use every opportunity to be able to celebrate something. Um, as small as it is, you know, because we've, we've never... Growing up, we never really had the opportunity to, um, to be the typical family. Um, we profile as what, what the rest of the world would probably call a dysfunctional family. Um, and, and there is no shame in saying that, that the model of family life that I grew up in um, is not the cookie cutter. And I'm sure many other people can identify with that. Sometimes your family, it's not really your blood. It's, it's people that you come to know along your journey. So to hear you talk about being able to catch up in terms of your relationship dynamic with mom and dad and um, siblings and, and, and other extended family members, it's, it's beautiful. And I think that's one of the blessings of, of being able to stay at home because now, Sam, you have no choice but to deal with some things. Yeah, and actually that time I, we needed that we needed that connection because my dad and well we have a really tough schedule when he's at home I'm studying or I'm at school right. and everything alternates I mean I'm always with my mom but we're always on the go what is she picking me up from school going to work rushing to do something with my dad so we never really have that family time and you know I'm going to tell you something I have to study for exams and I know my teachers are going to see this and I apologize but I have been studying I promise um <laughs> <laughs> for the past week or so actually no it's been the past two to three weeks every single night is movie night yeah it's been movie night and for me that is something I treasure because with my dad's family on his side every time we go to visit we all sit down together and look at that movie and it kind of brought back that memory and that feeling of my childhood and it was priceless I'm telling you Beautiful. it's really difficult being at home but I needed this time to reconnect I would say reconnect with my family and get to know them better because 
I'm seeing my dad smiling so much more often and seeing him smile, it's like a miracle. So it's all good. Here. It's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I'm, I'm, so, I'm so happy that you have, you're one of the people that I've encountered in this period um, who has found the courage to be able to admit that. Um, and to not feel guilty, and I know what you I know you know what I'm talking about when people like us who are always very proactive, we are workaholics, um, you know, we're, we're, we're always going and getting and we're achieving. And it's almost as though you feel guilty for relaxing, you yes. feel guilty for, for sleeping late or for turning the television on. But that's part of, I suppose, forcefully creating balance that did not exist in our lives before. So on the note of balance, Sam, I know this is not your first competition. And for your, your, the viewers here who are listening and, and viewing on this live, not everyone may, may know about your background in terms of your competition background, whether it's in pageantry or even if it is um, the many times if you've represented uh, your community or the country um, at something outside of the nation. Right. Tell us a little bit about how have you been able to create balance as a young woman, as a young adult with so much going on in your life? Well, from a very young age, I've been outgoing. Um, as far back as I can remember, primary school, I, I played cricket for a bit funny, right? I, I played cricket. And I did win an award for most disciplined player that I that I hold very high because you know it's cricket. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was actually I was the only female player on the team at that time, so Look that's a you. thumbs up there. Good job. Um, so, yeah, I, I like being involved in activities, but growing up, you know, you have to choose what you want to be involved in, especially you know when you are pursuing your educational pursuits. Right. For me personally, what do you think that I choose to align myself with? I make sure that it's for some greater purpose and not just something I'm doing for doing its sake. So I find my happiness and my sort of comfort zone in what I do. Now, I, I, I like expanding my horizon and learning new things. So while I'm, I might take on a, a venture, like let's say, for instance, activism in some instances, it must be something I'm passionate about. It must be something that I feel I can wholeheartedly give my all to. Because if I'm there and I'm showing up 25%, you're going to know and I'm going to feel very drained by it. And as long as I know I am present and I can give you my everything for yeah. some perfectly good reason that I'm not going to uh, fight with, everything tends to fall into place. There are times when it's really stressful, like last night, you know, it was my mom's birthday yesterday. Oh, I had, happy belated yeah. mom. <laughs> it was her birthday yesterday. My sister and brother-in-law, they came over from the night before. And uh, while I was supposed to be celebrating with my mom, I was pulling out all night the night before trying to fix exams and get things done in time. As well as I had a video to do for UNFPA that was due and needed editing. And then I almost forgot that I had a beauty session yesterday. Oh, <laughs> what happened? And I, I was so confused. But my yeah. audience says, are amazing. Let me just say that. They called yeah. me and they were like, Sam, it's about to start. And I was like, oh my God, today is Tuesday. Hot and I, I was able to stop and say, yeah, I was a hot mess yesterday. <laughs> and it was so frustrating that I felt I wanted to crawl into a hole and go under a blanket and just sleep. That's how I felt. And it is like that at times. Yes. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's all perfect. It is not. Yes, there are times that my mom and I would be so frustrated with each other because she's my chaperone. She's my driver. She's my go-to person taking me to all my events. Because I cannot drive. My father is probably wondering. Yeah. I told you so long. Go get your license. Get your license. Um, join, join the club. Yeah. We should probably go together. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's you that's know what? a real I'm struggle. Hold you to that. Yeah, I know. I hold me to that because yeah. I think I need someone to actually drag <laughs> me to licensing office. But you, well, you know what? My dad will be dragging both of us there. <laughs> <laughs> no shame at all. No shame. <laughs> but you, 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 from the, ever since I've known you, you've always struck me um, as someone very grounded, um, as a as a young as a young person and as a young woman, both categories, and, and just from the external, the way you purport yourself, uh, the things you associate yourself with. And I remember really getting to know, I don't know if you know 
that I actually knew quite a bit more about you even before I met you. Um, I think it was coming out of Miss Teen Awareness, the competition that you, you most recently won. Was it two years ago? That was in 2016. 16, oh wow, what's that? four years ago. Wow. And uh, you, you, when did you leave to go to Korea? In 2018, December. Right. So I remember meeting someone mutual to us. Both of that particular person was very instrumental in, in helping to get you to, to uh, Korea for that pageant. Um, it was Miss, Miss U University, was it? Miss University. University. University, yes. yeah. University. And um, I, I was at Queen's Hall uh, preparing for an event. And this beautiful woman, mature woman, who was doing some work with the company I worked with uh, previously, she approached me and, and she was telling me about um, this young woman that she's helping to, to go away. And, and I said, so anyway, she, she, just to cut a long story short, she told me about you. And, I, and my response was, I said, well, sure. Well, you know, email me some information about her um, and I'll see how we can help because we were in the middle of a major production. So I got back to the office um, and I got a, an email with everything about Samantha Rampasar. And I'm like, who is this girl? Um, and of course, I started to dig you up and I realized that you had been to, um, you're the, the title holder of Miss, Miss Teen Awareness here. Um, and so when I encountered you, I think, was it last year at Central Bank, was it? We were at an yes. event together, another, that same pageant, yeah. that same pageant, <laughs> yeah. But I've been saying to some of my fellow directors um, on the team, I'm looking at that girl, there is, there is something there, there is something there, and I want to get my hands on her. <laughs> and lo and behold, who pops up in our screening, Samantha Ampasad. So even before you applied for Super OTT, um, we kind of collectively on a national level had a sense of who this young woman is. But coming to get to know you, Sam, even though it's been virtually, I think you're one of the few delegates, if not the only delegates in the cohort that I actually have met in person before. But coming to get to know about your story and to hear some of your struggles, your struggles at home, your struggles with your own personal stuff, um, with school, with some of the advocacies that you champion, I got the sense that this girl is so authentically real and is so almost very comfortable in, in her skin. Where does that sense of being able to live in your truth, where does that come from? So I think growing up, you know, I would have been just like anyone. We had those moments where people will tell you, you know, be quiet, make people talking. Yes. You know, you have to sit down. It's a Caribbean thing, I, I most so believe. Mm -hmm. And I had it too, you know, but I was always outspoken. And I think with the activities that I involved myself in, it allowed me to have an opportunity to express my views on certain things. Right. And I have this. I won't say philosophy, but this saying that I tell myself every time, when an opportunity knocks, if it seems like it's a good one, even though I may not know exactly how to deal with it, jump at it and take it. If, it, if it's for me, I'll get it. And when I get in that situation, I learn as I progress and as I go along. So for instance, earlier this year, they had the Caribbean Regional Youth Summit, and I had no idea on you know the topic that they were discussing. And I went, I did my research before and I prepared and I was there and I was able to make a difference. And I learned so much. I connected with so many different people. So me being able to be comfortable in my skin is me knowing there is nothing wrong in what I say, but I need to be careful of how I say things and how I may approach people. So, you know, there are some topics that might be very, very touchy, LGBT rights in particular. Yes. I remember going to church and, you know, my pastor would very much condemn it. And I was very outspoken because at that time I was doing A-level law and my lecturer at that time would have, you know, told us about the legal aspect of it. But then I was right. able to put my two cents with the humanitarian aspect of it. And I put myself in that person's position and I was able to develop my own sense of being in that particular situation. Now, I would not experience exactly what they go through, but I do have friends who fall into the categories yes. and I'm able to formulate my own opinion. And when I realized something, I was being brave enough to speak up 
there are so many silent voices that actually need it. But for some reason or the other, they don't have that opportunity or platform, as we call it, to come out and say it. So mm -hmm. me being the person I am, it's not just for Samantha Rampasad, but it's for the greater good of my friends who are silenced by it. For instance, uh, suicide, I lost a really good friend to it. Um, she didn't have anyone to talk to. Or that's how she felt at the time. And uh, I'm here now to tell her story, but to also make sure and try to help improve it in some way. And I think as a youth, as a young person, it is so essential for us to recognize our worth and to realize that the things we say, the things we do, it's going to impact not just our future, but the future of the other generations to come. Because when you look at it, we all have this cycle of life where we grow. And if you stay quiet and you're not comfortable in being who you are, what do you expect and what situation your life is going to look like in the next 10 years from now? Are you still going to be a quiet, shy person who's just sitting in a corner and letting people do you as they please? Or are you going to be one of those, um, what do you call them, those keyboard warriors who just come on mm -hmm. Facebook and mention mm -hmm. something about the situation? Yeah. Trinidad, with a two day and two week mentality, it dies down. What change is that doing? Yes. So, by me being able to step up in some way, I know that I'm helping somebody else recognize their purpose and their reason as to why they need to step up. And there are times that I have been told things like, you would never do it, you can't do this, you can't do that. But guess what? I do it because when you tell me I can't, you're just fueling my energy and my passion to prove you wrong, but wrong yeah. in a good way, you know? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, my sense of being who I am just comes from me knowing what my purpose is, me knowing that whatever I do is not just for myself, but for someone else. I really hope to inspire my younger nephew. Um, he's 11 now and I'm getting him more involved in activism. We had to talk about the birds and the bees because I realized yeah. recently a lot of people tend to shy away from having a conversation with children, but they are the ones that might know a little more than we know. I wanted so, to be able to give him the right education that he needs rather than he has it from someone else. So, and that, you know, for me, you being empowered, but being able to empower someone else, to educate mm -hmm. someone else, it says everything that there needs to be said. Nice, nice. You've, you've very eloquently um, and very passionately woken up some some emotions in me and um i came to this particular sitting with you um with a very heavy heart sound and i know that the people who are, are listening and looking on may be torn differently because their lived experiences are different um <clears throat> people are affected by different things um, and they responded differently to situations which may or may not affect them. You use the term keyboard warriors, and we are this generation of people, we are so good at that. And we've become almost unconsciously keyboard warriors while so many other people are suffering silently. So... I want to I wanna talk a little bit about this is, this is hard because I am not an Afro-Trinidadian. My father is an Afro-Trinidadian. My, my mom and my mom's family are of Chinese, French, Irish, Portuguese descent. And then there are, there are East Indians in my family. And when you look at them in, in their ethnic pockets, um, in their own cultural traditions, they themselves have been, they've been their own, their own migrant community. Because we've all come whether we came on a canoe or on the Fatal Razak, whether we swam, whether we were brought here on a ship lay, laying down in chains on bunkers, we all have a history of a place that we've come from. And we are living through a time of, of, great, of great global hate, Sam. And it is so easy to perpetuate that hate 
if you are unaware and uneducated. And that's why I feel when I hear you talk about being able to influence and to teach your nephew at a young age, because that's the age where they are most influential, it is so critically important. So I, I want to throw something at you. I am guilty. <clears throat> I am guilty of being one of the people who have been saying for years that all lives matter. And I say guilty because I, I want to bring to your consciousness and to the consciousness of the people who are looking on at this live that fundamentally ingrained and deeply intrinsic in my humanity, that's what I believe, that all human lives matter and all human beings matter. And as a matter of fact, not just human beings, but all created things and all created beings matter. The earth, all of creation, our animals, everything that God has created matters because it's life. But that does not negate the fact that right now, in this current time, as the clock ticks, what really matters right now is the rise of hatred toward our Afro-Americans, our afro Tribagonians, and Afro every other um, cultural positioning that they, place that they live in. There is so much of hate toward them. That's why today I, today I decided to wear black. And it's why today in particular I decided to wear this, this top that um, was actually a Monday wear piece um, from the band that I play mass, and play mass with, uh, K2K Alliance and Partners. And our theme two years ago was We Stand United. It's on the side, right? We Stand United. And that was the brand. And that's why I've been drinking from this teacup. And the word on this teacup is called freedom. This was also part of our Monday package. What do you say, Samantha? What do you say to the generation, your generation, my generation, of young people who really are oblivious to what's happening in the world? Stop the cycle. Because we can't expect someone else to do it for us. You know, you, you were right when I said that our oh, education is important. Me, myself, I'm guilty of not being fully educated on the subject. But recently, seeing with everything that's going on, we in Trinidad would understand racism to be the local terms that we would use. You know, yes. Indian, so yeah. But when you look at it on a wide scale, and you take into consideration that phrase you use, all lives matter, I can't stand here and say all lives matter if I see you down the road and call you by some racial slang or right. Correct. I can't say that. And I can't say that all lives matter if I sit down in a coffee shop and see a black person at the door being refused entry. Yes. Then if I, by me staying quiet, I'm siding with the oppressor. It means that I am consciously ignoring something that needs to be addressed. Now, I'm all about picking your fights very cautiously. <laughs> But when it comes to a matter of equal rights and basic fundamental human rights, you sit and you see it happening. I can't call myself a youth or activist if I just sit down and do nothing about it. Yeah. And you would know this, that I'm very passionate when it comes to working with youth, mainly because we are the change makers. Now, I'm not saying that the older generations aren't doing anything. I'm just saying my core focus is empowering from the grassroots come up. Ah! Yes. Start from there. We have yeah. to start from there. Yes. Because me, myself, knowing when I was young, I didn't have anyone to talk to me about these things. Correct. So Correct. It's a lot of opportunities because Samantha did not know. And it's being exposed now and having the opportunities that I have, I'm able to bring back to those people who maybe were just like me. And don't get me wrong, I do talk to older people. I sit with my mom and we have the conversation. Yeah. Recently, that same thing on. Oh, no you know, the pandemic and, and with the rise of this particular movement, my mother and I had the conversation yesterday and yeah. it almost came into a very heated one. Yes. Because she would see something completely different to how I would see it, but I understand the generational gap, but somebody needs to bridge it. So I realized, while I might want to be a little more fiery with my mom, I need to pack down as we would say in local terms yeah. and understand things from her perspective before I can try to show her mine. 
after we finished having that conversation where racial slangs do show, you know, it, it, it indicates something about you. Now it's completely okay. So they think it's completely okay to refer to someone, you know, as an Indian. And I'll be very plain here and I'm going to say very true because I'm not going to sugarcoat anything because when you're yeah. down the road, you your friend saying it. Correct. You are an Indian person and you're saying that's Negro. Okay, all right, let, let's take a step back and assume this person is not being racist. But then you proceed to say, so black and ugly. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are you trying to say then? Or well, that Indian, or what she here is. And I, I'm telling you, I have experienced these things. I have friends from all different races and ethnicities. I was guilty of it too, don't get me wrong. When I was younger, because of what I was exposed to, I started adapting to it. But education is, now, it's not the only way to help, but it's the main way in improving on yourself in situations like this. The yeah. internet is yeah. so wide available. If you don't have access to it, sit down and talk to someone and have the conversation and say, you know what, I grew up saying this, but how can we change it around? Because I realize, you know, it's not the best way to approach people and it's not the best thing to say. Have the conversation. Only when, only when, especially us in Trinidad and Tobago, only when we are able to sit down and have an open discussion and dismantle and dissect this whole term of racial phrase and slangs, only when we are honest with each other about it, we can be able to progress with it. Now, with my mom, uh, the way she saw things was not the way that I saw it. She thought it was completely okay because it's, that's what you refer to them as, but it's yeah. not. Yeah, and sure. It's not with mom. I had the conversation with a few friends, you know, and it starts with me and you. If you don't know, educate yourself. And Correct. I listened to quite a few videos and people talking about in Trinidad and Tobago. I saw someone posted a status where um, they referred to the whites as the 1%. And they started bashing them like, whoa. And I had to press bricks on that whole one. Yeah. Because you need to understand something. Classism, being racial, and working hard for something that you truly deserve. Yeah, well, you're mixing everything in a party and you're just trying to... Yes, make yes, yes, yes. We yes. can't afford to do that. So we need yeah. to understand first, what is racism and what is the basis of it? What are the simple things you're saying and you're doing that you know you're adding to it? That's totally breaking it off, you know? Put yourself in that other person's position. Emotional intelligence is not something most people practice. But we need to start. We need to start because you're going to say something that you don't know how it's going to um, impact another person's life. Yes. So we said, we rise, especially amongst our teens. You know, because we, we, we live in a society where it's taboo to talk about your feelings. Yes. Because you're being soft. Get yeah. over it. Especially for men. Yes. For males. I wouldn't even start that because that's a whole conversation by itself. But yeah, yeah. we need to be more open to talking and having discussions about things that matter. Because unless we do that, we are part of the problem. Correct. And the thing is, Sam, we, uh, a lot of us are born into um, the belly of the system and the bile um, that lives in the, in the belly of the system. And more than likely, we are going to die and things are probably going to remain the same. Because it's just, it really is the cycle of life. For people like us who feel a sense of, we, we feel moved by, by matters of, of injustice. We feel moved to work for social justice, whether it's in our, in our intimate communities or in a wider range, because all of us are called differently. And we are called, some, not everybody's called to be an advocate. Not everybody's called to be a champion. Not everybody is called to be a spokesperson and an ambassador. But very fundamentally, I think we have to be able to stop for a while and really begin to address the first point of contact of conflict is, why is this affecting me so much? Because I'm not living in America. I'm not living in the United States. Does that mean that all Americans are bad? All Americans are racist. Does it mean that every person who is Caucasian is classist or is white? Or is it that, do, do we think that their views, their morale, their ethics represent their leadership? And we could see the same for ours. And so I, 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 I think I was getting into somewhat of a heated argument, may have been about a week ago, 
just when this, when Floyd lost his life, and I was asked the question, what would you say, Stephen? What would you say to your nieces and to your nephews and to your godchildren? Because I know me, right? I want to put on a Superman cape and I want to walk through the city and I want to burn it down. <laughs> and you, you spoke about it earlier. I actively, Stephen, singular, I have to be able to choose my battles. I need to know what I'm equipped to fight or not, not equipped to fight. And really hope and pray that somebody else would be raised up and called to do what I can't do. But here's what I can do. You see my picnic and them. You see my children, the children that I teach in classes. You see the young people in my neighborhood who I have an opportunity to meet and have a conversation with by the drain outside. You see my nieces and my nephews who are three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and are at an impressionable age. These are the t this is the time when I, as uncle, as brother, as daddy, as friend, I'm going to have that hard conversation with you because, we, as you said it, we didn't have anybody to do that for us when we were children. So we grew up psychologically. Our psyche is so damaged as a world that now that we're in our 30s, 40s, 50s, people are, people are slow to try to unlearn so when you're talking about talking to mom and talking to dad and to grandparents who are already stuck in their ways and were, were formed in a particular generation and asking them to see how the world has evolved over the past 2,000 years, it's like preaching to a stone wall. Yes, you said it exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, but I am going to say to my nephew, it's okay. It's okay, whatever his ethnicity is. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to say, no, I would prefer not to do this and not to feel as though the word no is oppositional. I would say to my nieces that you have to be able to choose the type of men you want to be with in relationships or the type of woman you want to be with in relationships because, of course, we're not talking about those taboo things. We're not talking right. about human sexuality. <laughs> and the list can go on, Sam, yes. about the list of taboo things from racism, colorism, classism, religious prejudice, and you name it. So when I see people like yourself and your other sister queens come forward in a space like a pageant that, that is already another taboo, because of course, you know, it's a cattle show and we're parading young women and, you know, it, what do you say to people who may not have the courage to champion something like you, because you've done quite a bit of advocacy work regionally and abroad. But what do you say to the person who's at home behind a computer screen, who may not be equipped with your passion and your drive and your resources, but are affected by what's happening in the world? What do you say to them? Advocating doesn't mean making a placard and going and stand up in the middle of Independence Square, you know. It yeah. simply means going behind your computer, your phone, and educating yourself because that's where it starts. Uh -huh. It's uh -huh. a simple thing to do your parents, your brother, your sister, like you said, champion from where you know to, change from where you can't reach. Do, my mom loves to say, don't hang your heart where it can't reach. Yes. And I think the same thing applies here. Yes. You know, like you said, we're not all called for the same thing. We all have different purposes in life. But, you know, you have the same passion and you have a desire for something, start from somewhere because don't sit down in your comfortable couch and say later and tomorrow and maybe next week. And somebody because else will do it. Nobody else does it. And that is something that is very prevalent in Trinidad and Tobago. Huh? That's all right. Somebody else will help them. Somebody else will bring it up. Yes. Does this situation ever come back up or does it just die down and stay the same? Yes. You know? And so, yeah, reach where you can reach. So it's simple. You know, I, I, I'm not going to bash the keyboard warriors because we do need them. Probably that's how they know to reach out and express <laughs> themselves. If that is you, then do it. But all I'm saying is if you have the ability to do more than just sit and tweet, do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say this pertaining to those in the U.S. currently right now. You see all of them in the streets rallying and protesting and bringing down buildings, which... I'm going to be very honest. I do not see the need for looting in a protest. I think there's so much more peaceful ways in which we can do it. I mean, Martin King, he, so many people in history have done it and got yeah. the results that they need. 
yeah. why I'm doing this. Because by you losing, you're just proving to them that everything they said about you is completely right and true. And you don't want to give them that satisfaction. So people need to think before they act. But um, yeah, it's like simple thing in Trinidad here. Do what you can do. Reach where you can reach. And everyone in the U.S. that's also in those streets, I hope that they're registered to vote. Because policy that's has a it. You know, and, it. and the same applies in Trinidad. We complain and quarrel, but when election day comes, mm -hmm. I feel I'm tired. But yeah. voting is yeah. right. Yes. And Clap you know, on that, Sam. Clap on that because I think... Things for repetitive behavior. What you expect out. What, what is the outcome you really expect? Yeah. If you turn today, are you going to somehow magically turn into water or something else tomorrow? Yeah, sure. So I, I fully support changed behavior, but you need to be very realistic with it. I think... I think very fundamentally, people are, people are tired, Sam. They're frustrated. People are angry. People are grieving. And I'm talking about not just all of those emotions which surfaced yesterday. This is decades upon decades upon decades of catharsis that has never been addressed. There's been no justice. And people are now boiling over with what we call fed up, you know, and, and we've lived through that here. We've lived through that with the Black Power Movement. We've lived through that with the 1990 attempted coup. And, and it's important to be able to, to, to connect the dots of how what, what happens abroad and overseas will influence and affect us here because we are in relationship, right? We're not living in a bubble. But I love the way that you say, put, put your pain, pour your pain, pain and your resentment and your anger and your point into the ballot box point That's into the ballot box where there are people who are going to stand on our behalf speak on our behalf fight on our behalf change policy affect constitutional rights that's how we're going to get a we're going to get a better result out of this and i'm and, and, and here because i know people are going to probably go to town on us and think that we're taking sides just, just for the record, I love having this conversation. So if anybody wants to feel free to inbox me also to take this on, we're not going to have an argument. We're going to have a discussion. And, and that's the thing. That's the thing. We have to be willing to hold the tension because it's a, it's a really difficult time. We have to be able to hold the, ten, the tension between varying opinions on how things are done. People need to be held accountable. I must be held accountable because I'm in a position of leadership. So I have to be, I have to be always mindful of what I represent, who I represent, what I say, how I behave. Does that make me somebody else? No. But I have to think about my family. I have to think about my brand, my business, my country. Because once you step under that light that shines, everybody else is looking. People are looking to be led. That's why we're hearing so many outcries because we do have strong, silvant leadership. People are fed up and we need, lead we need good, transparent leadership. So you are coming into a pageant that is probably systematic and probably one of those spaces where it is of the opinion of others that we are putting women against one another because of course they're competing who is taller than who, who is more beautiful, who has a better body, who speaks better. Let's address that a little bit because last year we saw for the first time maybe in history or if not a long time, the rise of five black women, five yeah. black women in the same year win international titles. Jamaica, um, Miss World, un uh, Universe, inter all across the board. Yeah, yeah? And when we say black, we're not just referring to our, uh, this black. Yeah. I'm talking about <laughs> Afro women of some, of some mixture rising to the top and getting a crown. What's your response to that? Because you are in a system where you have a lot of afro Jamaican sisters. I felt so proud seeing that. And I get it. I mean, I might be from a different ethnicity, but guess what? I understand the struggle. Because... And you're a black. Of, 
that's the next thing to her. <laughs> you know, in Tobago, they would look and say, when you go the- over there, you're black, you're black, you're black. You need to embrace it from now. I don't know who are they trying to fool if your foundation's five times lighter than your skin too. You're black. <laughs> the shade, Sam, the shade. No, but that's the thing. And the reality is I understand. Because aside from pageantry, you know, simple thing is going to school. Yeah. Um, I would have attended a private school for K for A levels. Right. And I was like, oh, so who are you, you know, culture, way of a little lifestyle changes with my friends at that time because they were yeah. more well off than I am. Yes. But you know, I'm going to point to you there. I noticed something and it did help me to recognize this for myself. Looking at me and the way that I, I would have carried about myself, you would not be able to tell the difference in the financial background of either of us. Right. And a lot of people mistake that. So they would look at me and make assumptions. She good. She she real good. She mom just do this for her. Her dad just carry her here. She in pageants. She on social media. She live in life. Now, if I were to take off everything and I open and shell out some months, right here on this table. Yeah, yeah. Clean, nobody's yeah. gonna know who is behind the closed doors. Correct. Sit down and you contemplate if what you're doing is helping anyone or if what you're doing is right. Mm. I might look like if I have everything together and I try my best to plan. And it doesn't always go according to plans. And when yeah. that happens, it needs to break down. But I try my best to, you know, align myself with the things that I want to do in the future. But nobody knows this silent cry. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying this because I have it too. Yeah. But when we look from a racial or ethnic background, my cries to your cries are different because we all have different battles and challenges to face. I cannot tell you, I'm not going to sit here online and say someone discriminated for me for my skin color or for the way my hair is. I have never been put in a position where I had to defend my right of being right. a human. So I cannot fully understand how my sisters feel when they come and say, well, they're telling me that my hair is too short or I need to go and style it or, or you know, do these different things. And yeah. I'm going to bring it up. Miss um, Wendy Fitzwilliams would have, you know, expressed her way in which a particular young lady should have changed her style of hair. Now, I do understand that she may not have meant it in the way that it came across, but again, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. You need to be very mindful and accept people for who they are. And a lot of us Black people, including myself, need to accept us for who we are. Our heritage and the foundation of our Caribbean society is built on our colonialism, where we came from. And like you said in the beginning, we all came from somewhere. First, you need to embrace that. But you know, when you look at international pageants, particularly where racism plays a major factor, Mm -hmm. it plays a major factor. And I'm telling you, because I experienced this one. Um, And to see the rise of five beautiful, confident and intellectual young women stand Mm -hmm. and represent not just themselves, but thousands of people who don't have that voice to do it. If that doesn't bring out an inner desire in you, I really don't know what does. Yeah, of course. But it makes me happy to, to really see this change because it was so taboo for a black person to say they want to do a beauty pageant. Correct. Why? Because my skin is not as light as yours. Mm-hmm. And we've seen it here in Trinidad and Tobago too, where, you know, a lot of people, would he say, she say, oh, Cuba warriors coming out to say, you know, why does she get chosen? It's because she likes her. Mm-hmm. And I want to draw reference to this too. Your physical appearance is not the only factor in most beauty pageants, I cannot say for all, because uh, you know I don't know all, but yeah. in most pageants, your pretty look's not gonna get you anywhere. <laughs> I've been in a situation where I sat at the table with some of the most gorgeous young women in the world, but as soon as they opened them out, you're like, what's happening? Okay, I had someone tell me, <laughs> for somebody who came from a third world country, you're very educated, and I didn't know if to feel insulted, happy. I was so confused. I'm yes. Like, hmm. I was like, okay, but my pageant sister at that point in time would have said, well, what do you mean by that? That came across very insulted. And she's like, no, no, I just meant that she, you know, she's so well-spoken. And yeah. I, 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 I was confused. I got but, that. <laughs> I've like, got that. What did you really expect then? Was I supposed to come here looking somewhere? You know, what did you expect? And yeah. so, that's not going to get you anywhere. So people who talk about, you know, pageants being taboo, 
and I understand, you know, that's our older generations would see it. My mom used to see it that way as well. So she was very skeptical about me wanting to do pageants on a whole. Yes. They just thought it would be an exploiting young woman. And with, with the modeling industry, we do see that happening very much. Um, so you need to be very careful in everything you do. I had a little experience where I almost got myself, well, not really me getting myself, um, one of the pageants that I did, Mm -hmm. uh, there were rumors that the photographer was selling our photos to a pornographic site. Mm -hmm. Now, my, at that point in time, I was only 13, going on 14. It was my very first pageant. And my mom was with me again, right through. Mm -hmm. And the photographer wanted us to take off our bras, completely take everything off for a headshot photo. Now, I did not know anything about pageantry. That was my first photo shoot, but I knew it felt uncomfortable. And I said, no, mm -hmm. whereas the other girls did it even though they didn't want to. Yeah. Well, saying no again is the next thing, you know? Um, so while I said no, I was, I was okay. So I was like, okay, even if these pictures do get out at that set point in time, I know I'm okay, but what about my other sisters? Sisters, yes. And they think about it and we need to think about things too. But because of those little one or two instances, we kind of put a stain on the entire industry. It's not good. It's just exploiting women, making them compete against each other. But how often do, does a person really sit down to understand what is the pageant about? Because my mom was telling her friend the other day, yeah, Samantha's in another pageant. Uh. Okay. And I'm here like, and, and I knew I'm very skeptical because this particular friend, a very, you know, very judgy in a way. So I was waiting for the phone call, you know, to have yeah, the yeah. What you doing, girl, you know? But yes. I didn't get it, I don't know, as yet. I'm hoping to get it soon. But people need to understand the purpose behind pageantry. And maybe in the past it was really just a body beauty aspect. But most pageants, Miss Rule, Miss Supranational, they have a, a purpose for it. Yes. You know, Miss Rule has a beauty with a purpose project. Mm -hmm. And you with your own, and, and this is something that really attracted me towards the pageant, it's a project and a ground building that you're doing self-development phase that you know I had like a whole wow moment with you know <laughs> when you reflect on yourself and you basically look at yourself in a mirror and you really don't want to see those ugly sides to you but it helps you develop as you go along correct you know so it's not just about your pretty face it's about, it's about your intelligence the way that you're able to deal with situations what you stand for what you represent your yeah. own personal um, identification on your own personal brand you know so you were talking about and you mentioned um this person approaching you I'm, I'm gonna be honest nobody asked me for my information so now i'm like how this person would have known all of this about me and for the young people especially <laughs> looking on it's very important for you to be mindful what you post on social media because i had a lot of opportunities come to me because of my social media yes you know yes so it, yeah, it, yes it, everything everything can be used uh for good um if if handled with wisdom so Sam, in these, in, thank you for sharing that. In these last few moments, um, because you're very good at, at co-hosting, because it feels as though we're co-hosting something. <laughs> um, I, I know that you, um, you got news recently, and so we want to share this with your viewers, and for those of you who are likely to see this at a post-dated time. Uh, our international president, Gerard von Lipinski, and the Miss Supernational Organization recently launched officially uh, a, global, um, a global project, which is called the, do you know? From the Ground Up. From the <laughs> Ground Up, yes. So From the Ground Up is going to be our uh, community service project where it's very grassroots in its character. And it's, it's, it's geared toward helping communities to feel as though they are part of a whole. And so for a long time, we've seen a lot of, chari um, a lot of charities and a lot of movements um, start up but never go anywhere because um, they just never have been afforded uh, resources and the energies that other uh, more prominent um, uh, organizations or institutions or NGOs, NPOs, etc., may have gotten in the past. So we are looking at the Community Service Initiative, the CSI, which is called From the Ground Up. And this year, all of our delegates of Miss International around the world and here at home in Trinidad and Tobago 
are going to be championing their own projects. So they are going to be bringing something to the table, which we, the executive, will not dictate. So Sam, tell your viewers, tell your friends and your supporters, what's your from the ground up uh, movement? So recently we would have launched our Supra social responsibility project. And, you know, I talked so much in this interview, I'm sure people are tired of hearing me say this, but my passion really lies with youth. So the, my initiative is called Youth for Empowerment, where we start from the grassroots coming up, educating young people and young adults on topics that might seem taboo, you know, shied away, not, you don't want to have the discussion about really yeah. talking to them, telling them what it is and opening up to them so that they can explore for themselves the meaning of certain things to understand and develop emotional and cognitive intelligence, because it's important for us to help other people, especially our youth, like I said, understand their true purpose and meaning and impact that they can have in life. Yes. Preparing themselves today for the future of tomorrow. And the first phase, because of the pandemic, which turns out, you know, forcing us to use technology a little more, um, it's actually online. So it's going to be via Zoom and Instagram. Now we're going to be talking on topics of racism, um, domestic violence, rape, female and male genital mutilation. That's it's, one phase where we have the other phase being an educational pursuit, teaching you about your physical health, uh, your mental well-being, teaching you skills on makeup, and something that I look very forward to, and I think I'll be launching as a third phase, is a community-based project where it's really targeting the youth to come out and learn more on agriculture. Because the oh, pandemic yes. has taught me something today and more so than I would have ever seen. You know, I used to be one of those people who I'm quarreling, you know, quarreling with myself. Why doesn't the government invest more in agriculture? Yeah. When I saw it, I was like, Sam, you waste any time, but you can't start. And so I thought about educating youths on, you know, the purpose of having even a simple home garden where I do hope to branch it out into a community-based project where they can all come together and plant stuff to sell it, to be able to continue that um, social business and keep it going. So right. it's been very interesting so far. And the great thing about that is, while I, it was initially for Trinidad and Tobago, I'm able to get my project international. So I do have a few international sisters, especially for my past pageant, who are mm -hmm. on board with me to implement this, this project in their country, such as Namibia, Kenya, and England. And then we have yes. other people here in the Caribbean that are doing it from Barbados and, J and Jamaica and Guyana. So I'm really, really excited to see how this goes. Um, it's been stressful, I won't tell you. It's a bit of process, you know, trying to plan everything and, and help out with school. And then you have the pageant you want to focus on. Sometimes it's a lot, but I'm taking it one step at a time. And so on my social media at s.rampasad underscore MSTT finalists, 2020, you would be able to see all the updates there concerning my project. And I really, really would appreciate it if you all join in. Now, I know my project is really, you know, tailored and focused on youth. But if you are a person that may not fall into that category necessarily, and you are interested in learning, I am always open to accommodating you. Because it's all about reaching out and touching more people. And I do hope that whatever you know, our participants learn from this project, they are able to take it to their friends and family as well, so that we help get the grid out there. And I'm seeing that this project needs to go beyond just a four month period and something that needs to keep going because of the request and feedback we've been getting so far. So all good on my end and I'm really excited for this. Good, so it's all about reaching out and touching people. So you could for yourself from the mouth of the beauty queen she is going to be the face and the voice of the community of shogonas and for her project to remind us of the name of the project sam it's youth for empowerment there we go and so we, we we leave this interview with the understanding that even though it's targeted toward the youth and young adults but the approach toward empowering our youth and young adults has to be an integrated one. So it involves all other stakeholders, members of the family and members of the community, because we are all in this together. Sam, it was so wonderful chatting with you today. Uh, it's been good getting to feel your heart beat virtually. <laughs> I know we've not been able to meet in person as yet because we here at Supra, we are... Um, 
we are trying to be as obedient as we possibly can and um, to <clears throat> adhere to the rules and to the regulations as is stipulated by our government officials. Um, we are practicing these steel tone measures. For those of us and for those of you who are looking on, we really want to encourage you, if at all possible, and you can stay home, please stay at home. But if you must venture out, you know what you have to do. Make sure you wear your mask, make sure that you maintain your social distancing, that you don't only take care of yourself, but be mindful of others. Um, sanitize frequently and keep your environment clean and look out for your brother and for your sister. So that's it for us for now. We've come to the end of this sit down chat. It's called Mastering the Life with yours truly. And in case you want to continue to connect with Samantha or any of our other delegates or even us on the executive, you can reach us on any of our social media handles. It's at Miss Supernational TT. You can slide up into our DMs, send us uh, an email. It's uh, crownsandsashes868 at gmail.com. Um, if you want to support in, in, in various ways, because again, we are building from the ground up. And so this franchise is not a franchise that belongs to us, but it belongs to the entire community of Trinidad and Tobago. I am Stephen Jones, your National Director of the Supernational Trinidad and Tobago. And until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.